Hi, my name is Savannah Tibbetts, and as the president of Praxis, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Eric Rasmussen. Currently, Dr. Rasmussen is a professor of business economics and public policy at the University of Indiana, or I'm sorry, um, Indiana University, Bloomington, and he earns his Bachelor of Arts and Master's from Yale and his PhD in economics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Previously, Dr. Rasmussen taught at several universities, including but not limited to Oxford University, um, University of Chicago, and University of Tokyo. He has also been a senior research fellow at Harvard Law School. Dr. Rasmussen has published a variety, um, published in a variety of areas, including um, economics, law and economics, applied game theory, and industrial organization. In fact, his main areas of interest include um, industrial, or not industrial organization, but actually law and economics, social regulation, crime, and asymmetric information. He's the author of Games and Information, um, An Introduction to Game Theory, it's this book right here, which you may recognize from the class that Dr. Trelor taught last semester um, in, for game theory. And I asked him before, and he said that he's willing to sign your copy, so if you have one, um, you'd be happy to do that. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Rasmussen. Um, when Savannah asked me to come and talk about game theory, I immediately thought of a situation I'd blogged about recently, because I'm on a group blog called Law and Economics Professor's Blog, which is uh, one of the many Obamacare cases, the Halbig case. And that's what I've gotten together to talk to you uh, today about. And maybe I'll actually try getting this, um, this little analysis uh, published at, at some point. Because it's a nice application of pretty basic game theory, that I think some of the judges in the cases um, could have done with, with understanding better. Uh, in fact, uh, let's see, how many of your economics majors? Raise your hand. Quite a few. Uh, there is a very interesting um, kind of Hillsdale-like thing that uh, George Mason University runs of economics classes for judges. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of that. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> they had the, um, uh, well, you're not judges, so that's okay. They, uh, let's see, who was it who started this? Henry Maddy, a big name in law and economics, had a good idea. He thought back in the 70s, it's too bad that judges don't know more economics. What can we do about that? He's a great fundraiser and knows lots of potential donors, so he got a big pile of money, and he started having economics classes for judges. He'd have some very top economists come and be given a big fee for teaching for a day and have a number of them, so it would be a variety of perspectives. And the uh, students were federal judges, real big shots. And uh, the judges liked it. And part of the reason they liked it was they knew that he had a conservative aim in mind. He made no, no bones about that. But he taught the courses as straight economics. And he explained this to them. All kinds of conservative guys are donating to me. I'm conservative, but I think just fair economics, uh, barely taught, will make you have better decisions, and you should think that too. And they agreed. So judges, liberal and conservative, both, especially those that didn't know much economics, uh, came for these classes. And they continue on today with uh, many state judges now. I think at one time something like a third of the federal judiciary may have gone through these classes. I went through myself a, a few times, but um, not as a judge. One time it was as a, uh, a student because they had law for economics professors, and they had us meet at the same time and live in the same dorms as the economics for law professors program, which was great and fun. Uh, also, I taught in that to some of the judges, and it was quite scary at first, since if you've ever seen a courtroom, judges ask very piercing questions, and probably their, their greatest talent is being able to tell when you're telling something you know about and when you're telling something you're, you're faking on. But it went quite well. Anyway, in this case, it would be game theory uh, that would be useful. And to understand the case, we have to start off with Obamacare. So I didn't have my cover slide up there. I tried this out on my students at Harvard this year, at undergraduates, and disappointed them because this talk's not going to be about whether Obamacare is good or bad, especially. It'll be about the lawsuits and especially about the procedural issues that come up. But in the background of this is the gigantic Obamacare bill, 
and I have its chief provisions up here on the screen now, some of which are in this case, some of which are in other cases. So let's see how I list them. Uh, first one, health insurance plans have to be high quality, meaning they cover a lot of different things. In some sense, they can be low quality because they can restrict who your doctors are or something, but they all have to cover contraceptives, for example. That's the subject of the Hobby Lobby case, where Hobby Lobby Company was a private corporation held by the Green family that didn't want to offer <coughs> emergency contraceptives, the morning after pill. Very small part of the insurance, but they would be fined hugely if they provided it. They won at the Supreme Court level. I'll actually be talking about uh, the regulations that are flowing from that, where the administration tries to pare back and control the Supreme Court decision as much as they can at Notre Dame on Monday. So it's not too far away, and if you love this so much you can't stand going home tonight, <laughs> go home anyway and come over to South Bend on Monday. Okay, uh, second one, there's going to be a 40% tax on really high quality plans. The idea is we're spending too much on health care, and one thing economics does teach, if you're getting too much of something, tax it, and you'll get less of it. So that's the bad thing about the income tax, we get less labor, but uh, if we think for some reason there's too much health insurance um, that rich people are spending on, then uh, tax them a lot and they won't spend so much on nice uh, single person uh, hospital rooms and things. Third, insurance companies can't refuse applicants just because they're already sick and they lose money. That will come into my talk a little bit today. Um, four, everybody must buy insurance, either via their employers or as individuals. And that was the subject of the, the biggest um, lawsuit that could have killed the whole Obamacare thing, the, what I like to call the broccoli case, where it went before the Supreme Court as to whether the government could require people to buy some product, and that to be health insurance especially, Broccoli was one of the things suggested. Or whether that was an infringement <coughs> on our natural liberties. <coughs> and so beyond the power of the federal government via things like the Commerce Clause and the taxing power. Actually, uh, the jurisprudence is that I think most, most scholars or most people probably would say that a state government with its general police power could require you to eat broccoli. Some people would say the U.S. Constitution prohibits it, but, but uh, in general, states can do lots of things. But the federal government, and you all take a Constitution course, I guess? Mm -hmm. Is that freshman year? Yeah. yeah so you want to think, oh, good, good. Then you know that the federal government only has a jurisdiction over certain kinds of things. And that case is fascinating in itself. All of the uh, constitutional law professors said, this is totally crazy. Of course, this is interstate commerce. And then the court, um, said by six to three, it, no, it's not interstate commerce. But nonetheless, by a five to four vote, they said, uh, the, penalties, the, the penalty for not buying health insurance is a tax, and there is a taxing power. Okay, finally we get to the subject of Hall Big, I think. Yes, if you're poor enough, the government will pay for most of your insurance policy. I'll come back to specifically what's going on here. It does seem an odd thing to have an objection to. Then six, anyone who employs over 50 people must buy them insurance. That's the employer man mandate. And finally, Medicaid, which is government insurance for the very poor, uh, would be expanded. And that was also a subject of the big case and one where the administration lost because uh, Medicaid is partly paid for by the states and the federal government, the, uh, in this uh, Obamacare bill was um, said to be unfairly coercing the state governments because it threatened to take away all of Medicaid if they didn't expand it in this way. So the court said you can't um, put federal muscle on the states to force them to spend money that way. Okay, so those are the various cases, but we'll focus in on one clause in the bill. It's a huge, long bill. You can see with all the things I was describing, there's a whole lot going on, and it all has to be administered, too. One of the things that uh, has to be defined is coverage month. If you are uh, covered for a coverage month, then you 
um, don't have to pay the fine for not having the insurance, and you're entitled to the subsidy if you're poor enough that um, the government thinks that you need help paying for the mandated insurance. So let's look at that coverage month for an applicable taxpayer who buying insurance. From the first day of the month, the taxpayer is covered by a qualified health plan described in subsection B2A. So that means one with the contraception and all that stuff, a good government uh, managed health plan. That was enrolled in, so not just any, any health plan, it has to be enrolled in through an exchange. Pause there. The government also, um, in the bill, established insurance exchanges, one for each state. And those exchanges could be set up and maintained by the state, where the exchange would organize the various private insurance companies that would uh, administer the individual policies. And also importantly, having the exchange would let the government keep track and pay out the subsidy to the people. So it had to be, if you're in through an exchange, then you've got a coverage month. If you're not, then you're not. And then the controversial words for helping established by the state under section 1311. Okay, well, if the state didn't want to set up an exchange, then everybody agreed, left and right, all, all lawyers, that the federal government can't force a state to set up an exchange. Somewhere else in the bill it actually says states must set up exchanges, but nobody thought that could ever be enforced. So if a state didn't want to for some reason, then the federal government was authorized by the bill to set up an exchange for that state and to administer the, and organize the private insurance companies. Well, if you look at this in sort of a plain language, it looks like if you're going to be in a coverage month, and you've got to be in one in order to get the, the subsidy, then you have to have been in some time buying your insurance, not just the kind of insurance plan that's mandated, but through an exchange, and not through just any exchange, but one established by the state. But what does established by the state mean? It may seem a funny question to ask, since it seems like one was being set up by the state. But if that's so, then we've got an unexpected consequence of the bill. Because in the majority of states, there's no state exchange. Because the state governments have, contrary to expectations, refused to set up exchanges. There are federal exchanges, but you can't get the subsidy through them seems if you follow the plain meaning of this language. So, what about the poor people who have to buy insurance or be punished by the federal government? Well, that triggers something else. Uh, this is a quote from the uh, Halbig um, decision that was in a, a, an appellate court earlier this year. The individual mandate requires individuals to maintain minimum essential coverage you have to have those coverage months, and enforces that with a penalty. Uh, the penalty does not apply, though, to people for whom the annual cost of the cheapest available coverage, less any tax credits, would be more than 8% of their income. Okay, well, if you're in a state with no federal, with no state exchange, you can't get the subsidies, and the insurance plans are going to be too expensive. There'll be nothing available for you that cheap, so the mandate doesn't apply. So we've got some millions of people who wouldn't have to be enrolled in Obamacare. They wouldn't get subsidies, but they wouldn't have to enroll either. Moreover, the employer mandate wouldn't be triggered. The ACA penalizes any large employer who fails to offer its full-time employees suitable coverage if, here's the big if, one of those employees enrolls in a qualified health plan with respect to which a tax credit is allowed. That's the subsidy. So if you're in a state with no tax credits, then uh, none of your employees could uh, get one of those plans, so the employer mandate doesn't apply either. So it looks like Obamacare has been made optional state by state as far as a lot of its provisions. Not all of its provisions. So number one there, high quality insurance, that doesn't depend on the tax credits. So all insurance plans have to offer contraception. Um, and the tax on very high quality plans 
uh, will still apply. And the insurance company still can't refuse applicants, but four, five, and six um, become largely optional. <coughs> Okay, well, nobody realized this at first. There are a lot of things about Obamacare in the bill that nobody quite realized, uh, partly because it was rushed through. Uh, the problem was that a version had passed the House of Representatives, a version had passed the Senate, and then there was a special election because Senator Kennedy died, and he was replaced by a Republican in Massachusetts, of all things. Um, in the city of Cambridge, where I used to live, um, the Republican candidate would come in third, usually, after the Green candidate. <laughs> but anyway, Senator Brown won, and that meant the uh, Democrats only had a 59-41 uh, um, yeah, majority in the Senate. They had to worry about filibusters, and it would be very hard now to have a reconciled bill that both the Senate and the House would pass, because they have to pass the exact same bill at some point. So what's the way out of that? Well, they didn't, didn't think they'd have to do it, but if the House of Representatives simply votes for the exact Senate bill without changes, then that's okay. So uh, they did that. The House of Representatives had its own bill with different wording and different provisions on this and that, but the Democrats there had a majority and they said, oh, okay, it's the Senate bill or let the Republicans have all kinds of influence on it to, stop a to prevent a filibuster so we'll just pass your bill. This meant, though, that the bill that was passed was one nobody expected to be passed, because when the previous December the Senate had voted on this, they thought, well, sure, we've got this bill, nobody's actually read it all the way through, and uh, we're working on it you know, last night trying to get the wording right, but it doesn't matter because we'll have to fix it up in order to reconcile it with the House of Representatives anyway. So we'll fix up any problems then. Well, so there, in fact, looking at, at this case, there are all kinds of little weird things in the wording of that bill they, they should have done better. Okay, well, this came before the court because somebody said uh, that they shouldn't have to buy insurance in their state because the, they can't get tax credit for it because the tax credit is against the law, against the statute. The government passed regulations say basically ignoring the state exchange, federal exchange issue. But the appeals court in the District of Columbia ruled that uh, the federal government had overreached when it passed a regulation to interpret, to say that the language established by an exchange was basically to be ignored. Uh, and that was by a two to one majority. A different appellate court ruled the other way, the opposite way. And uh, by a vote of 3-0 said, well, I'll shortly show you, that you could ignore that language. And there was one dissenter in the Halbig case. And he's the one who will need to learn some game theory. But what the Halbig court decided was that the words established by a state were not ambiguous. Even if you look at the broader context. And if you did this, then it wouldn't make the bill so absurd that no rational Congress could possibly have wanted to pass a bill like that. Because the argument against this, as given by the dissent, was that that's what had happened. If we look at the majority opinion, it illustrates uh, a difference in two kinds of judges. Or we might say, everybody in the world is, just falls into one of two types. First type are the rule followers. They say, um, our role is quite limited as a court, just deciding whether the IRS rule, ignoring the established by a state exchange, is a permissible reading of the ACA. That's the Obamacare bill. So they're saying, well, we just have to look at that statute, and look at the wording, and so forth. And uh, if it wrecks the whole bill, or means we'll have a humongous deficit, or something, then too bad. Uh, there's a great quote that I forgot to put on the slide, so I'll do it now. Some of you will have Latin, and maybe you can help me. The famous fiat, justitia, let's see now. Something chiral. Oh, ruat chiral. Anybody know if that's right or wrong or can read it? The one I'm picking up, it says, let there be justice though the heavens fall. 
And that's what the old English judge would say. We're just here to interpret the law. If you wrote a bad law, then too bad, or if it results in unfairness in one case. The other kind of person is the one who says, like this judge, this case is about how it's not so veiled attempt to gut the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. He's saying, well, the role of us judges is to make the law work, and if the words don't work out quite right, then we're supposed to change them. Uh, in fact, something else I should have caught on a slide, because I like to recommend books to students, is a book by Thomas Sowell called A Conflict of Visions. He distinguishes between the unconstrained vision, <coughs> which is this second type that doesn't like strict rules <coughs> and says, let's get everything perfect. We can do it. And administratively, let's have, give a lot of discretion to our leaders, find somebody good, put them in charge, and let them do whatever they like. And the constrained vision, who are the economistical ones, actually. And they say, well, we're always going to make mistakes. Let's try to get some rule that works and stick to the rules. And everybody has poor information and, sus and is likely to be selfish. So we can't give people a lot of discretion. Also, oddly enough, another thing he notes, which I think kind of matches this, because what he does in his book is show that there are a lot of views that fall into these two camps, is the constrained vision people uh, tend to uh, look at their, their rivals or opponents and say, well, we, we agree to disagree. I can see you're coming at it from this direction. I'm coming from this direction. I think you're wrong, but that's because your information is bad, or um, I don't know, you were biased, you were, your parents beat you, or something like that. <laughs> Whereas the unconstrained vision people say to the rivals, you must be acting from evil motives. It's kind of a conspiracy because they're unconstrained. They think, you know, if everybody just agreed, then we'd have the right thing. The other guys aren't limited by their information or something. They are evil guys. So Judge Edwards looking at this. He's looking at the lawyer, at the uh, people who brought the case as evildoers who are just trying to mess everything up for technicality. Okay, let's see if I can find something he says. Wrong way. Okay, so what he said, first of all, was um, that when Health and Human Services creates an exchange, it does so on behalf of the state essentially standing in its stead. Put differently, under the ACA, an exchange is a given. The only question is whether the state opts to create the exchange or if HHS do it on its behalf. So that means established by the state is a term of art that includes any exchange within a state, even if it's set up by the federal government. Um, and uh, let's see if I've got something from Next one, let's see. It goes on to say, uh, basically, um, the, the purported plain meaning, um, now here he's kind of showing his, he's not being a good judge. You're not supposed to um, uh, say that you're the other side's in bad faith. What he should say here, of course, is the plain meaning, which is wrong, but instead he says the purported plain meaning, which to him isn't plain at all, would subvert the careful policy scheme crafted by Congress, which understood when it created the ACA that subsidies were critically necessary. Um, the uh, 36B, that rule interpreted as appellant's urge, would function as a poison pill to the insurance markets. This surely is not what Congress intended. So he's trying to say that, well, don't look at the words, look at what Congress intended instead. And uh, let's see, no legitimate method of statutory interpretation ascribes to Congress the aim of tearing down the very thing they attempted to construct. Appellants have invented a narrative to explain why Congress would want health insurance markets to fail, and states did not elect to create their own exchanges. Uh, I'm going to do that with game theory in a little bit myself. This is on your handout. Simple truth is this is a fiction, a post hoc narrative concocted to provide a colorable explanation the otherwise risible, laughable notion that Congress would have wanted insurance markets to collapse in states that elected not to create their own exchanges. And in the other case, uh, the one in, hmm, I 
forget which state, the majority two judges said, well, we think this is a, a, uh, a close case, but we come out for thinking that um, we have to uh, uh, revise the plain meaning. The minority judge, Davis, was more like Edwards and uh, said that uh, the majority correctly holds Congress did not intend a reading that has no legislative history to support it. So he's saying, well, those are plain words, but if you look back at what Congress was doing, we don't hear anybody talking about that in Congress. And it runs contrary to the Act's text, structure, and goals. He doesn't really mean text, or he can't truthfully mean it there, but structure and goals, maybe. Appellant's literal reading um, renders the entire congressional scheme nonsensical. Nonsensical. Okay, well, there's one sort of law where everybody would admit that you don't use the plain meaning of a law or a rule. And this is an old idea from contract law and contract interpretation. Suppose two people make a contract and they write it down and everything, but there's a draftsman's error. Somebody might put in millions of dollars instead of thousands of dollars, for example. Or, uh, as was in one famous case that I couldn't find in the five minutes before this, but I uh, can find for you later if you want. There was a contract where somebody was supposed to uh, uh, build a bridge, and the amount he was going to be paid would depend on the surface area of the bridge, and he wanted it to be the literal surface area, including the underside as well as the top. <laughs> um, in cases like that, a court will look at the words and try to decide what the parties really meant at the time. And the question they'll ask is whether it is absurd and in no state of the world they can imagine a reasonable man having a contract with those wordings. So if, you're, uh, if you have a contract where you agree to pay um, $10 million for a small condominium in Hillsdale, um, well, don't, don't think you've hit it rich. The court will assume that that's an error and you must have meant $10,000. Something like that. And that's reasonable enough. So the idea here is we don't want people to have to put too much care into writing contracts. We don't want typos to, uh, to match. But of course, this is a very dangerous uh, notion. And so it's strictly limited in contract law because all the time you have people saying, I didn't mean to sign that contract. That won't do it. It has to be that the words are such that the judge can't think of any possible reason why you would have signed it at the time even if you were mistaken in your beliefs. Um, could there be a $10 million condo in Hillsdale? No, I, I don't think so. If it were 500000 then then probably that would be enforced. Um, I don't suppose there are any of those either. I don't know if there are condos in Hillsdale. <laughs> That's good. Um, it's better to have towns without condos. Okay. Well, um, there is a story for why the Democrats in Congress would have wanted to write a bill like this. So what the majority opinion did, and what judges uh, do in this kind of case, are supposed to do, is say, okay, we've got these words which are kind of odd, and one side says they didn't mean. But is there any reasonable story to tell by which they would have actually wanted to write those things down? even if they regretted it ex post, after things were over. And that's the story that's in this game tree. And I've set it up uh, with Harry Reid and Governor Pence as the two players. Harry Reid was the Senate uh, uh, majority leader, and still is, actually. Uh, governor Pence, the governor of Indiana. Reid is a Democrat, Pence is a Republican. Okay, Harry Reid, we imagine, back drafting this bill, trying to decide whether you should have no state exchange, no subsidy, so that literal meaning, should you put in that clause, or should you say a federal exchange is okay for a subsidy? And we'll just start off by saying that he's pretty happy even in this case. He gets a payoff of 10, and Governor Pence is unhappy because he doesn't like um, having semi-nationalized health care. These numbers are just ordinal numbers. I could have picked any, any two numbers for this, actually, because all the other numbers are relative to these two. Okay, 
Next, we have to think, what would Governor Pence do? If the federal exchange is okay for a subsidy, it doesn't matter what Pence does, whether he sets up a state exchange or not. And um, if he doesn't, though, and we have the no state exchange, no subsidy, then Harry Reid is very unhappy. I put a negative 20 there to indicate how much he's deeply unhappy. He's crying, he's sobbing on the floor at this point. Um, but Governor Pence is also unhappy because uh, his people don't get the tax subsidy then. So, and Indiana, um, he won't have the mandates applying, uh, so he's maybe happy about that, but uh, the poor people aren't getting their money. <coughs> On the other hand, he didn't have to set up an estate exchange. He's happy about that, saved a little money, but um, uh, uh, basically unhappy. Or, if he does establish an exchange, then, in this game, um, Harry Reid is having his best outcome. 12 compared to negative 20 or 10. It's a little better than having this branch, because now the state has set up the exchange. And Harry Reid wants the states to set up the exchange. However, um, Governor Pence is a little bit unhappy there, uh, because he has to set up the exchange. Nonetheless, Pence will see that his best outcome would be to uh, not have to set up the exchange at all, uh, but his worst outcome is where he doesn't set it up and where that means his people don't get the insurance credits. So if these are the payoffs, then Harry Reid would want to write in no state exchange, no subsidy. He would have wanted to put it in in order to provide incentive to the states, to Governor Pence, to set up the state exchanges. However, that isn't what happened, of course, ex post. My interpretation would be, well, Reid was wrong. It isn't negative one up there. It's really negative four. Because that payoff to Pence depends on Pence's preferences. And Reid, being, being a Democrat, probably thought that Pence would think it was just a horrible thing and he couldn't get it, the uh, tax credits for people in his state. Pence, though, as a Republican, actually doesn't like that. Every, everybody likes more money for their state. Um, however, he minds even more having to uh, have Obamacare in his state. So in this story, um, Harry Reid rationally put in the no state exchange, no subsidy clause. It's just he was wrong in the end and thus arrived at an outcome which he didn't like at all. <laughs> I didn't set it up that way, but if we formally want to put in this mistake by Harry Reid, we make the game slightly more complicated. Because we start off with a move by nature. So if you use my book, we'll, we'll recognize that move where nature chooses one of two games, <coughs> the Pence negative one game. So that's the one as drawn. And the Pence negative four game. So nature's choosing a state of the world, whether it's one in which Pence doesn't mind having exchanges too much, <coughs> or one where he minds them a lot and we can think about what Harry Reid's uh, beliefs were. He thought it was probably this world where Pence um, only mined a little bit, so he was putting perhaps 0.95 uh, probability there, only 5% probability on this being the outcome. Then the rest of the game was, would go on with Reid making his decisions, but where crucially he doesn't know how nature moved. He's having to guess which is the payoff for the pence. And that means he'll have to look at his expected payoffs and compare the 95% chance of one against the 5% chance of the other. Now, I didn't work out the numbers on this, so it may not work out at the end, but some of you can start doing the calculations uh, if you feel like it. OK, so that's one possible uh, game here, uh, a story you can tell. And uh, you can ex uh, expand this a little bit um, also, um, because you can put the Supreme Court in as a player also. And that introduces a, a very nice little quirk in this. 
Suppose that after Governor Pence um, doesn't, uh, ex uh, if we go to, to no exchange, no subsidy, and Governor Pence doesn't set up the exchange, so that's where we are today, now we go further and we have them take it to the Supreme Court, which has not yet happened. It's been appealed to the on bank, full set of judges for the DC Circuit, um, but it will probably go on to the Supreme Court after that. And suppose that Harry Reid believes that the Supreme Court will um, not enforce this. Um, it is no state exchange, no subsidy that goes this way. If he was thinking that back in 2010, then he has another reason to put in this language, because then he could regard it as a win if I lose, win if I don't. Because as long as Pence believes that it's a coercive punishment, Pence will set up the exchange, and in the end, if he doesn't, then the Supreme Court will rule for Harry Reid anyway, and he'll be back down here to federal exchange is okay for subsidy. Uh, so that's another possibility, and I don't know how the Supreme Court uh, will end up ruling on this. I think I'll stop there for questions and come back to other stuff if there aren't enough. But I know for my, especially for my class, there were enough questions I, I maybe should pause. So, any thoughts on these, these occurrences? Actually, we weren't ready for questions anyway, so I will go a little further. You raise your hand when you think of one. <coughs> okay. There is something else that comes in. to do with the payoffs, which I haven't seen enough attention to. And that is that maybe Harry Reid will be happy with this outcome. Seems strange, but here would be a story why. The mandates are mandates. When you mandate something, you're forcing people to do it. That means they aren't happy doing it. Um, they could have made Obamacare so that uh, People could buy insurance if they wanted to and could get tax credits, but didn't have to buy insurance. But that's not the way it's set up. Instead, if you're poor enough, then you do get a lot of your premiums paid. But there would be a lot of people who aren't buying insurance now who would end up paying $500 or $1,000 for insurance for the year and who don't want to do that because they're not spending anything on their medical care. What will those people think? if Obamacare is optional for their state and the governor chooses not to do it. Well, presumably they'll be happy. They'll say, I didn't want Obamacare because I was uninsured before, but if I have to pay $500 for insurance, it's not worth it for me. Other people, of course, are already sick, incurring huge medical bills, and for them, paying $500 to get $100,000 worth of care is a really good deal. So they'll be really unhappy if this doesn't go through. But the question is how many there are of each type. Uh, really, the premise of Obamacare is that there are a lot more of the healthy type. Because the premise is that once we have these insurance markets, where even the sick people can buy insurance, there'll be enough healthy people forced to buy insurance that the insurance companies will be able to break even on it. And that won't work unless there are a great many more healthy people um, than there are uh, people who are initially unhealthy. So, by if uh, the courts do, uh, say that Obamacare doesn't have to be enforced in those states, can't be enforced in those states, that means there'll be a lot fewer people who are mad at the Democratic Party. And that will be better for the Democratic Party in elections. This is one reason, quite clearly, why a lot of the Obamacare provisions uh, were delayed a lot from when the bill was passed in 2010. They knew that if it came to effect in 2011, the president wouldn't get re-elected. Um, and uh, that's true whether it's good or bad policy. There are a lot of good policies that are bad politics, so even a virtuous uh, politician would want to postpone implementing those. So that's a bit of price theory to apply to this also. <coughs> now, pause again. Go ahead. If there are no questions,
questions, I can keep on going indefinitely. That's the advantage of my rambling style. <laughs> Let's see, uh, oh yes, yeah, this is, this is a good thing to look at in general. Um, because uh, another sort of lesson of game theory, though it's a totally non-technical one, is that you have to figure out who the players <coughs> are. And that's different from just saying there's a government policy. What will the government policy be? What game theory focuses attention on is, well, what is the government? The government is a player, it's Harry Reid or Governor Pence, it's not Indiana or uh, the Senate. And so we have to look at the interests and preferences of all the people involved. Anybody know what cui bono means? These students, I won't ask, uh, professors can't reply. Means uh, to whom the good? Um, uh, where's the money is, is another kind of interpretation of it. And if you do use economic analysis, that's what a lot of the consumer and producer surplus stuff is about, is seeing who benefits. So who here? Taxpayers in Indiana? Well, they, uh, they'll pay for Obamacare no matter what. They'll pay a little bit less if Indiana doesn't have the tax credits. Um, taxpayers in the rest of the US? They'll be happy because they're paying a little bit less because Indiana doesn't get any tax credits. Poor people in Indiana. Well, the very poorest people are covered by Medicaid. So they don't care. It doesn't matter for them. They didn't have to pay. They don't have to pay for their health insurance because government provided anyway, uh, regardless of how health it turns out. Medium income, middle income people in Indiana, or medium poor, sorry, they're the ones who now will uh, be free from both the uh, tax credit, um, which is bad for them, but from the mandate, which is good for them. So they're the ones who will be split depending on their health and their desire to buy health insurance. Um, for them, they may be getting a uh, $5,000, $8,000 insurance plan, paying only $1,000 out of pocket, which seems like a great deal. But if you never get sick during the year, you'd rather have the $1,000 <coughs> cash. So they'll be split. Then middle income people in Indiana, uh, Let's see, they'll be largely unaffected. Most of them will have employer insurance anyway. Um, and uh, let's see, they are still, um, they are not released from the individual mandate. Um, they'll, speak, they'll be able to buy insurance. So they're maybe unhappy either way. They don't have insurance yet or indifferent. And rich people, uh, same way. Um, they may be employers, though. And for employers, being free from the employer mandate is a good thing. So it gets a bit more complicated with that, because if you're free from the employer uh, mandate, then your employees um, are free to buy health insurance elsewhere than through your employer plan. They may or may not like that. Probably not. But in general, you'd like to have less um, government restrictions on your, your plans. Oh, and the other thing about this is that if a company isn't offering health insurance as a benefit currently, then um, the uh, basic economic uh, uh, analysis is that the employees don't want it and would be hurt by it. Because nothing in all of these laws says that when the employer starts offering health insurance, he can't cut the salary. And if employees were offering a given value of package before, say uh, $30,000 of um, cash and no health insurance, and they're now forced to offer something else, $20,000, say $10,000 of health insurance, they'll cut back the, um, the cash part of the compensation. If they thought it wasn't a good way to attract employees before to lower wages and increase health benefits, then there's no reason why they would start to think that way. Okay, Governor Pence, well, he, is, he has his own um, personal uh, policy preferences, and, but also he's looking at all of the other people here, and some of my colleagues think he's looking at taxpayers from the rest of the US because he wants to run for president because he's been quite a successful governor. President Obama, uh, as I was saying, he'll be mixed also. Um, it seems that he did want this to apply to the whole country, but politically, I was suggesting he may be better off 
if there aren't a lot of people being forced to buy health insurance who don't want to pay for it. And finally, doctors and hospitals, uh, they're definite losers. For them, the more money spent, the better. And so they like both the tax credits and the high taxes, means more money on medical care, and the mandate. So they're, they're the big losers out of all of this. Okay. I have time for one more subject, or for a bunch of, or for any questions. I'm trying to decide which one. Somewhere I'm looking for the point about what the intent means. Ah, I don't know what talking about. Dr. Rasmussen, mm -hmm. you focused on the history and how it kind of came about. Can I yeah. stretch you to ask about where do you see this in the next two or three years? With the political intent and the economic impact of the ACA. <coughs> oh, let's see. Okay. Um, predictions about the Supreme Court. Well, anybody can do that, so I shouldn't be scared. Um, I think uh, courts tend to hate being really important. Um, they have strong ideological views, and, they, and a lot of judges are willing to impose them on other people contrary to the law, but they always feel a little nervous about it. And in general, judges also are, um, if they see, they, they don't believe fiat justitia uh, ruet caelo. Um, instead, if they're going to cause too much of a rumpus, they'll pull back and not follow the law. Um, sort of looked like that's what happened with Justice Roberts in the, the big Obamacare case. Since he acted that way then, I suspect in this case, he might also say, okay, we're not going to go with the plain meaning, we're going to say this is absurd or something, and let the law stand. It's a little harder to say, though, because in this case, the, um, the Supreme Court, like the politicians, may be quite unpopular with the people on, uh, who have to obey the mandate later on. So if they're worried that this will be a huge mess later on for the whole country and for them, then they might be willing to make Obamacare optional for the states. It will probably also depend on the result of this November's elections. Because if the Republicans have a big enough majority, or have a majority, um, it may be that they'll be actually able to uh, amend the, the bill and things will work out somewhat better. So I guess I'm saying that I think the Supreme Court will be chicken, will say, okay, we're just not going to pretend this case never existed, <coughs> and um, we are going to, um, and then it will come into effect and there will be millions of unhappy people who will be screaming at the politicians and Probably, I suppose then maybe the eventual mandate will be removed at that point and will probably just be left in the end with more government spending on health care than we started with. Actually, I'll also mention another lawsuit that is the most fun one of all, I think, to an academic and where I'm also pretty sure the Supreme Court will, will be chicken, though I'm not sure if they, which side ought to win completely. And that is the lawsuit over the Obamacare bill having originated in the Senate instead of the House. I see some people nodding their heads. Well, what happened there was, as I said, they passed the Senate bill. But, and that would be illegal, revenue bills, and the Supreme Court said it's a tax. After all, there's a lot of revenue stuff. The IRS is writing the regulations. Revenue bills are supposed to start in the House um, in emulation of the House of Commons. But on the other side, the Senate did take the House bill and stick it into a, sorry, the House did take the Senate bill and stick it into a shell of its own. It wasn't coerced at all. They were very happy to do this. So you could argue that the intent of this is just that the bill has to come, can come from anywhere, but it has to formally have the first vote in the House. And, uh, let's see. Well, you, you have to have the, the House vote for it, and then the Senate agree or disagree. Um, that may have happened. I don't remember. The, the details are a little hazy in my, in my mind. Um, and if that's so, then, then Obamacare is valid. 
I mean, the fun thing about it, though, is that it's a little, little technical point. So if we go back to the two kinds of people, those who are sticklers for the rules will say, a rule is a rule, nonetheless. Everybody knew about this problem from the first month it was passed, and they should have done something then if you were worried about disruption. That doesn't mean we should uh, forget the law of the Constitution now, and just because you've put yourself into a big bind by starting a, to implement a law that you knew from the start shouldn't ever have been enforced. Ah, yes. You said that the middle income earners might sort of be neutral on the decision. Um, but I was wondering, since in, in um, a world in which there was no um, individual mandate in the state of Indiana, other health care plans that weren't necessarily up to Obamacare's standard would be allowed to re-enter the market. So those middle income earners who could afford to buy health insurance but didn't necessarily want to pay quite as much as they would have to on the exchanges would be able to purchase these um, now illegal plans, and then those who didn't want to purchase health insurance would no longer have to. So isn't that sort of a win-win? It would be, except the um, you couldn't have the old plans. So that part, that sort of point one of my list of things in Obamacare was the high quality contraception mental health coverage plans. Those would still be required of everybody in every state. And in fact, um, the every state prohibited it before, but um, now it's maybe even harder to get the plan that I would really like to buy if I were doing this individual or if I were telling Indiana University, my employer, which plan to get. Um, I, and most economists actually, would only like catastrophic care. So I'd like an insurance plan with a $20,000 deductible, meaning there's no bills, no administration stuff, lots of costs saved for medical care that happens almost every year of my life. But when I do get a heart attack or come down with cancer, then I'll have insurance for that. Because uh, it's kind of hard to explain why it's rational to have insurance against the sort of small expenses that happen every year. If we all, I mean, not all you're pretty young actually, but if uh, middle-aged people like myself ordinarily have a couple thousand dollars of expenses for me and my kids, and it's $2,500 one year, $1,500 the other, uh, it makes much more sense simply to have enough in savings to be able to balance those out, <coughs> rather than have insurance take care of it. And insurance for something like contraception um, makes no sense at all economically. It isn't really insurance because if it's something where you know you'll be spending the money, if you know you're sick already, then you're not uh, guarding against risk. You are just getting somebody else to pay. And that's good if it's the government paying or other people who don't use contraception and are work for your company. But if it's something where I could spend $500 in contraception myself, or I could buy an insurance policy from some guy who will then pay for the contraception, pay exactly the same amount, it's crazy to have the administrative expenses of the insurance. So actually, before Obamacare, when I told my classes how to reform health care, I said, uh, re get rid of all the state regulations that prohibit low quality, which is catastrophic, health care plans. And the other thing that economists recommend and that politicians almost never will accept, though McCain did, uh, partly, uh, I guess it didn't hurt him any more than he was hurt already, um, <laughs> is to uh, tax health insurance benefits provided by employers because that's an implicit subsidy to health care, and it's a bigger subsidy for rich people than poor people. So whatever kind of a public welfare theory you have, it's very hard to justify, but there are a lot of middle income and rich people who benefit by it, so politicians won't touch it. Yes? Yeah, I was just a little unclear on one point. Towards the beginning of the lecture, you mentioned that this bill, just because of the way it ended up getting passed, the final version was not meant to be the final version and that it was intended to be revised a little and wasn't able to be because it got sent to the house. Um, but later when we were doing game theory, we were talking about um, potential motivations for why Reed would have wanted the wording that way. So my question is, are you saying that Reed's wording was intentional or Reed's wording was intended to be revised? Ah, okay. The legal principle there was that there is a reason why a rational person might have written it that way. In fact, uh, we don't have any <coughs> evidence anybody thought of it either way at the time. 
And uh, one, one of the people say sometimes, why put such an important thing in a little clause? But even the idea of requiring the tax credits only to be available if you buy it from an exchange, that's the only place where that's mentioned. So um, it looks as if people were thinking about the other more, more glamorous parts of the bill. And uh, there just wasn't a lot of public discussion. In fact, somebody else on my blog was uh, a lawyer working for writing um, regulations for Obamacare at the time. And he says nobody was thinking about that. But then again, nobody was thinking about it either way, he said. It was a big bill. Uh, there is actually some evidence on legislative intent now. And I and the, the majority in Helping think it doesn't matter because if the plain meaning is clear, and if there is a story that could have happened, then you shouldn't have to go searching for documents and tape recordings and things to find out what people were actually saying. Uh, particularly since, um, and if I had another half hour, I would have talked about this, just the very idea of what the congressional intent was is rather difficult. If it's just Harry Reid, and he's dictator of the Senate, then that's, and he's dictator of Congress, actually, then all that matters is his intent. But President Obama had a somewhat different intent. The House had a different intent. We know that because they wrote a different bill. And in fact, of course, every member of the Democratic Party or Republican, there were some who voted for this, had something different in mind. In particular, the state federal exchange idea was in there, as I recall, because of one senator, a Democrat from North Dakota or South Dakota, whose vote they wanted to get, and he was a more conservative senator than most of the majority, but they needed him because he was the 60th one. And he said, I don't want to have this all be a big federal government bureaucracy thing. I want the states to implement it. So the whole idea of state exchanges was probably just the intent, or the, the sort of first best desire, of one of the people who voted for it. Um, the Republicans all voted, or voted against it. So that's 40 who were against the whole thing. There were 59 who would have preferred just to have federal exchanges. And there was the one guy who wanted the state exchange. So if we think about legislative intent, whose do we mean? Yes? Yeah, you mentioned in, uh, towards the beginning of your lecture as well uh, that there was a going to be, under the law, a 40% tax on what they call very high insurance plans. Mm -hmm. So what really made 40% the magic number for those crashed in the building? Why is that the most appropriate taxation rate? Oh, well, uh, I don't know. This is a good illustration of this. I don't know their actual intent. So we can construct a plausible story for why a rational man would have written that in, which is this, uh, this current tax benefit for insurance. Because currently, these rich people are getting insurance, and their company is paying the $20,000 a year for the policy or whatever. And they, uh, they were talking about high quality insurance policies, so these are the rich people. And they're paying close to a 40% tax rate. But they're not paying tax on that $20,000 of their compensation. When this goes into effect, they still won't pay income tax on it, but they will have a special health care tax, which will amount to about the same thing. Um, that's one of the, uh, the, the um, cost-cutting measures of, of the bill. Oh, and I, I should have... Of course, there is a new word that has come out of the Halbig case. And oh, I'm trying to remember who my MIT uh, economist colleague is. Who is the most important economist in writing the health care bill? Hoover? Hoover, yes. John Hoover. Um, uh, you may have heard of this, heard this story, but um, he was saying that uh, agreeing with Judge Edwards is totally ridiculous, would kill Obamacare. We, uh, nobody could possibly think that we meant to uh, uh, make it optional for the states. And then people dug up some of his old speeches where he said that very thing. <laughs> Back in 2010, shortly after he passed, he was saying, well, the, uh, the states will have to set up exchanges. I'm sure they will, because otherwise their citizens will lose the tax credits. And so he's terribly embarrassed by that. And the new term is, he said, <coughs> instead of a typo, I made a thinko. 
Um, back then, I don't know what I was thinking. I was crazy to think that, just like these whole big majority judges, you know, we all go out of our minds occasionally, and he, he went wild at, at that point. Um, uh, I, I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts now, but I haven't met him yet or, or heard any of the gossip for, for how he's responding to that. Oh, except, let's see. No, there was, in, when, well, this is not gossip, but apparently uh, in the... Um, some of the lower court Obamacare decisions, uh, they, of course, you cite all kinds of experts on the likely numbers of people who will do this and that and so forth. And Gruber, being genuinely a very top economist, so he's a, he's a genuinely one, one of the best five health economists in the country, was cited a lot in the government briefs. Apparently, now that this is going to the full District of Columbia Court of Appeals, they don't have any references to his work anymore. <laughs> Okay, I wasn't sure, but I think there were masks now. Thank you.